8 World Famous Paintings Hey guys, Culture here. Today we're going to be taking a look at 8 World Famous Paintings. More specifically, we'll be examining the context in which they were made and deciphering their meaning. Looking at fine art is amazing, Culture. So rich and vibrant. Just like Starburst Chews. They're the candies everyone's talking about. Why not go out and grab some today? Ugh, jeez, Crash. I know you're taking this hard, but it's been three weeks now. The Starburst sponsorship isn't going to happen, buddy. They're not interested. How can you not be interested when there are so many flavors to choose from? From blackberry to peaches and cream, there's a flavor for everyone. Let's, uh, let's get on with it. Number one, Creation of Adam by Michelangelo. Phone home, E.T., phone home! Uh... Phone home, E.T., phone home! Um... Just call home! These lyrics are so poorly! <laughs> the creation of Adam is the fourth panel painted on the roof of the Sistine Chapel by Italian sculptor Michelangelo between 1508 and 1512. The scene depicts God and Adam with arms outstretched towards one another, with God giving Adam life. God appears in a nebulous cloud of figures in a white tunic, surprisingly plain compared to more powerful and imperial earlier depictions of God. It is thought that the grounding of God with a more human physique evokes the major theme of this work, stated in Genesis 1.27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Yet the small distance between Adam and God's fingers suggests that Adam has yet to be given life, perhaps explaining his somewhat laid-back posture. Is that also why God has all the ladies and Adam has none? Adam's gonna get himself some Eve action and fast! Well, two of the figures surrounding God are of particular interest, the woman and the child under his arm. Some people theorize that these are the Virgin Mary and the Christ child, or perhaps that the woman is Eve herself, waiting to be created from Adam's rib. So Adam is just getting God's sloppy seconds? Not cool, God. Not cool. What's especially amazing is that Michelangelo wasn't even a painter, but rather excelled in sculpting. But when Pope Julius commissioned him to paint the roof of the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo went above and beyond the Pope's desires, and came up with the entire idea to depict the key events from the Book of Genesis. His expertise with sculptural anatomy shows through in the twisted, muscular bodies of both God and Adam. Oh, I get it. The red swirling cloak thing is like a uterus that Adam is being born out of. Oh, what? No. Well, actually, uh, moving on. Number two, The Starry Night by Vincent van Gogh. The Starry Night is an oil on canvas painting created by Dutch artist Vincent van Gogh in 1889. The night sky itself, which predominates the image, was painted by looking out of his room in the St. Paul Asylum in the St. Remy de Provence of France. Why was he in an asylum? Well, he, uh... He had a breakdown, cut off his ear, and sent it to his girlfriend. It's called romantic passion! Some people just don't get it. The work was created using both real and imagined elements. One of the real components includes the bright star just left of centre The astrologers determined was actually Venus, based on the date on which Van Gogh says he saw this image, July 19th, 1889. The moon and village were made up, however, with the village presumed to be based on Van Gogh's native Dutch architecture, as typified by the steeple in the centre of the village. The cypress tree in the foreground, a common symbol for death, connects earth and sky. A quote from Van Gogh may shed some light on what exactly this means. Just as we take the train to go to Tarascon or Rouen, we take death to go to a star. Well, we did already say he was in an asylum. That might also explain why he inconceivably thought of his work as a failure. Seriously though, he didn't enjoy dabbling in abstractionism, and much preferred to draw inspiration from nature. The swirling of the sky, whilst visually pleasing to most, made Van Gogh anxious that he was straying from true representation of nature. Personally, I just think the colours look great. Just like Starburst, the deep blue of blueberry, then the bright yellow of lemon. A great combination. Starburst, come for the colour, stay for the flavour. Number 3. The Scream by Edvard Munch. The Scream is a composition in both painting and pastel forms made by Norwegian artist Edvard Munch in 1893. The inspiration for the image came one day when Munch was walking with two friends and suddenly heard, quote, a huge endless scream course through nature. He recalls his two friends leaving him, the two figures in the back of the painting, as the air turned to blood. And what's the thing in the middle? Is it Macaulay Culkin? The actual screaming creature itself is a twisted personification of this scream, a sexless mutant being with hands clasped to the side of its head. I repeat, is it Macaulay Culkin? The being isn't based on any real thing, but rather on the emotions Munch felt in that moment. 
This turning of the inner world onto the canvas is called expressionism, and the sheer madness of this image scared Munch himself. The distorted depiction of the creature made Munch fear he may himself be a madman, not an irrational fear since his sister Laura suffered from a schizoaffective disorder. As a sort of rebellion against this idea, Munch grounded the painting in reality, by countering the Art Nouveau curves of the sky with the rigidly defined perspective of the roadway in the foreground. Munk believed that his art relied upon his childhood suffering, even saying, Without anxiety and illness, I am a ship without a rudder. Isn't that a lyric from The Cure? Number 4. Dogs Playing Poker by Cassius Marcellus Coolidge Dogs Playing Poker is a collection of paintings created between 1894 and 1910 by American artist Cassius Marcellus Coolidge, more commonly known as C.M. Coolidge or Cash by his friends. The 16-piece collection was commissioned by Brown and Bigelow Co. to sell their cigars, but the somewhat endearing and mischievous images quickly became iconic. A common misconception is that dogs playing poker is a single painting, but most often people are actually thinking of just one painting in the collection, titled A Friend in Need. This image shows five hounds facing down two bulldogs, who are cheating below the table. The idea for the collection itself came from the original 1894 piece, simply titled Poker Game. Yet there are also pictures of dogs playing rugby and even dancing. Ah, oh, these are adorable! A far cry from all that emo stuff that Norwegian guy was into! Our critics would agree with you, but for a different reason. These paintings are considered by art elite to be lowbrow, lacking any real meaning or substance. As an April Fool's joke, the Chrysler Museum even released a statement saying, It is now time for these iconic images to assume their rightful place on the walls of our institutions where homocentric art has too long been unjustly privileged. But joke's on them because our man Cash made a bunch of money off of his works anyway, with individual pieces selling for upwards of $300,000 each. At the height of his success, he even married a girl 35 years his junior, who, ironically, preferred cats. Number 5. Composition 8 by Wassily Kandinsky Composition 8 is an oil-on-canvas painting of odd geometric shapes made by Russian painter Wassily Kandinsky in 1923. Whereas dogs playing poker was a relatively easy concept to understand, this painting may seem needlessly complex and, uh, wanky. What you need to understand is that at the time, Kandinsky was a member of the Bauhaus movement, which sought to reinvigorate mass-produced crafts with creativity. Kandinsky also sought to generate a kind of universal language built upon symbols rather than words. A combination of these ideas led to the integration of rigid shapes and bold colours in his works, with Composition 8 being the epitome of Kandinsky's Bauhaus work. Oh, I see! That white triangle in the middle is a head, and the darker triangles jutting into the right-hand side of it makes a nose! And that white circle in the darker triangle is an eye, and oh, that's another eye floating up there. And those two black lines coming out from the right-hand side are arms holding that saxophone made out of squares. And that's a record in the top left corner. I was going to tell you that you're wrong, but honestly, I have no idea. All I know is that Kandinsky was interested in how colors and forms could exert psychological and spiritual effects on the viewer. To me, it's interesting how the painting seems so dynamic and yet so peaceful all at once. Of this and later works involving circles, Kandinsky said, The circle is the synthesis of the greatest oppositions. It combines concentric and eccentric in a single form and in equilibrium. The variety of emotions I feel right now is only challenged by the wider range of Starburst lollies that exist. Fruit chews, babies, snakes, and even the delicious Starburst sucks lollipops. Try a whole new way to experience the unexplainably juicy flavor of Starburst. Number 6. The Persistence of Memory by Salvador Dali. The Persistence of Memory is an oil-on-canvas painting rendered by Spanish artist Salvador Dali in 1931 as part of his Surrealist movement. Dali believes Surrealist paintings were like hand-painted dream photographs, designed to capture the subconscious workings of the human mind. His interest in the teachings of Freud taught him that dreams could have meaning, and in this way he explored the notion of time through the desolate wasteland of melting clocks. The destruction of the clocks as seen by both the melting and the ants signifies decay of time, and an inconsistency with how we experience time. For this reason, scholars thought that the painting may be an allusion to the theory of relativity by Einstein, but Dali himself said that the clock's form was derived from the sight of camembert cheese melting in the sun. 
Sticky cheese is one flavor that doesn't exist in the fantastic Starburst range. How about lime or maybe even pineapple? Try a few with your friends and see which ones you like the best. Share something juicy today. Hey, uh, wanna talk about drugs instead? Dali says he got many of his ideas by taking drugs. Or as he puts it, I don't do drugs, I am drugs. He actually said that. As a result, Dali said his painting surprised even himself, so there's no clear answer to the meaning behind many of his paintings. The central creature in the picture is thought to be a twisted self-portrait, however, with a large nose and closed eye with long eyelashes. Furthermore, it is known that the cliffs in the background are the same cliffs from Dali's home in Catalonia, Spain. Perhaps this childhood setting, coupled with the motifs of melting clocks and the sarcastic title, indicate a fading of Dali's childhood memories, a realization of his own mortality. Personally, I prefer Dali's infamous work, The Great Masturbator. Crash, shut up. No, seriously, it's real, look it up. Something about it just speaks to me. I know it's real, but still, shut up. Number seven, Guernica by Pablo Picasso. Guernica is a composition made by Spanish artist Pablo Picasso in 1937, as if you couldn't already guess by the weird cubic figures. On the bright side, this painting has a clear message, one of the chaos and horror of war. The painting was made after the Nazi bombing of Guernica, a small town in the Basque region on the border of France and Spain. The scene depicts a bull and a horse, presumably frightened by the bombs, trampling over a mess of human figures, all in black and white to both hide in the drama of the piece, but also to give it a newspaperish feel, as though it's reporting on the bombings. Black and white are so dull when compared to- No crash, just no. Art critics argue over the meaning of the bull and the horse in this image. Some say the bull represents darkness and wrath, whilst the terrified horses represent the people of Guernica. Others point to the bull as an important animal in Spanish culture, and that therefore it may be a stand-in for the nationalist party that Nazi Germany was supporting in the war. Picasso has said of this work that this bull is a bull and this horse is a horse, going on to say that their meaning is not intentional, but rather subject to the viewer's mindset. What a cop out! And I bet that eye light bulb thing is just a random coincidence as well then? Basically. It may represent the spotlights of the German bombers, or demonstrate the overwhelming power of the artificial light bulb when compared to the lamps held by the citizens of Guernica. The violence of this event is made more horrendous by the fact that the Nazis seemingly targeted market day in Guernica, a day when innocent civilian casualties would be as high as possible. This violence is exemplified by the replacing of the tongues in the picture with what appear to be daggers, although that could just be Picasso's weird art style. Number 8. The Son of Man by René Magritte The Son of Man is an oil-on-canvas painting by Belgian surrealist René Magritte, painted in 1964. Magritte's painting takes the self out of self-portrait by almost entirely covering his face with a mysteriously floating green apple. The painting invites curiosity as we, the viewer, desperately want to see behind the apple. For some reason, those things that are hidden intrigue us most. As Magritte himself puts it, we feel a sort of conflict between the visible that is hidden and the visible that is seen. Right, whatever you say, dude. I think he just has a fetish for apples. For some reason, though, we aren't interested in the overcast sea scene obscured by Magritte himself, perhaps speaking to the way our eyes are drawn to the lively green of the apple. One more odd detail is how the man's left arm appears to bend backwards at the elbow, another sight which invites curiosity. In the 1999 remake of The Thomas Crown Affair, the accomplices wear bowler hats and suits, like the Son of Man, in order to confuse and escape police. Something about the faceless businessman aesthetic of the picture heightens the oddity of it. Many of Magritte's works exhibit similar themes, such as the Great War, in which a woman's face is hidden by a flower. Screw apples and flowers! Starburst is what's on everyone's lips! Literally! Thanks to new Starburst lip balm! You can have that delicious fruity Starburst flavor you know and love with you wherever you go! Crush, please. That's right, everyone! You can have Starburst even in the classroom! The juice is loose and I ain't talking about OJ! Crash, enough! We didn't get the Starburst brand deal, and you'll just have to deal with that, okay? But... But why, Culture? I did everything right! You grabbed the Starburst rep by the lapels and shook him. Do you remember what you yelled? I remember expressing my passion for Starburst! And how did you express that? By yelling, GIVE ME YOUR STARBURST OR I'LL SMASH YOU OPEN LIKE A PINATA! And then what did you do? Well, I... I hit him with a baseball bat repeatedly. Like a piñata. Let's just be happy you didn't press charges because I told him you were my ward by reason of insanity. The only thing it's said about me is my craving for that juicy Starburst goodness. See you next week, everyone. Oh,